Okay. Well, welcome to the San Diego Astronomy Association's March program meeting. We've got a really good uh, meeting tonight and a great talk from Dr. Ashley Baker from Caltech on Hyrax. It's a new way to study hot Jupiters. I, they, they want me to put an apostrophe after Jupiter to pluralize it and other exoplanets. And I believe this is a hot Jupiter, uh, allegedly. Okay, they want me to do it this way. Uh, the SDA calendar is busy as always. Uh, I I think the weather is going to preclude stars at West Sycamore on Friday, and I'm not sure about uh, uh, the member night. Uh, the 21st of March is another West Sycamore that's during the week, and that's a special event for a group who wanted to capture the early moon because of their... Uh, uh, of their uh, uh, social practices. Uh, we won't be able to do it exactly uh, because the moon will be way too small. However, we'll have a regular star party anyway. All the other uh, uh, items are pretty much the routine that you expect. Uh, the April program meeting will be Zoom again. Uh, the next one we will have in person will be in June with uh, Tim Thompson from uh, um, Mount Wilson. A uh, couple of dates at the bottom to keep in mind for long range planning, uh, TDS spring cleanup at our own site at TDS, get out there with your shovels and you know cleaning equipment and so forth, 20th of May. And if you're planning things to do for the summer, Palomar Observatory tours resume in June. Thank you, Andy, for doing that. A uh, couple of news items. That's Hale Bop on the left. You know, that's not the best picture of Hale Bop. We ought to have a wide field shot with it coming up about the size of the moon and everybody standing around. Uh, you know that comets are very popular to the public, but they're notoriously fickle. But however, they are talking about a first or second magnitude comet uh, that was discovered uh, by this. Uh, Asteroid impact late, last alert system in South Africa, and, and ZTF confirmed it uh, back in December, should be at its brightest point between October uh, 12th and 19th of next year. So next year, we very well could have an eclipse and a very bright comet. Uh, so it'll be really good for public outreach and traveling too. Astronomers have discovered uh, our, our Lyra stars in the far fringes of our galaxy, about a million light years away, which gets it almost halfway to the Andromeda gal galaxy. And uh, I have no idea why random stars would be up there, but it gives a whole new meaning to the intergalactic medium. And by the way, the Boy Scouts just, just noted that... Uh, the Astronomy Merit Badge is in 30th place in terms of popularity and the number of merit badges attained. Uh, Eagle required merit badges tend to be at the top. So citizenship in the community, first aid, swimming are one, two, and three. And just in case you wondered, the lowest place is bugling at the 138th ordinal. I always like to show one of our amateur pictures. We're transitioning sites right now, repository sites. So it's hard to get something fresh. So this is one from uh, last year that Tim Lewis took at TDS. This is the Cygnus wall section of the North American Nebula. And I really like images like this because it was taken with a one-shot color CMOS camera. Just three... Uh, you know, over three hours worth of data and, you know, get good clean, good clean data, one shot color, and you don't have to be a filter head to get good results. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Ashley Baker, and I don't know what a 51 Pegasi B postdoc fellow is, but it certainly sounds impressive. A postdoc fellow at Caltech, and she's an instrument science scientist and a research associate in astronomy with the Exoplanet Technology Lab at COO. 
Uh, she's building a new instrument for the Hale telescope, amongst other things, that can image a star in multiple high throughput narrowband band pass is achieving an R of about 2000. And that makes it ideal for atmospheric classifications of exoplanets. She earned her BS degree in physics from uh, Chapel Hill in 2014 and completed her PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. So she's an Ivy Leaguer in May 2020. So with that, let me turn the meeting over to, uh, to Ashley. I would you like us to hold questions to the end? Um, no, I think if people have questions during the talk, feel free to, to keep interrupt. it open. So yeah, so respectfully interrupt and or put things in the chat as we go along. Thank you very much. Let me get this down, and it's all yours. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. Um, very excited to chat with y'all today about this. A project that I worked on um, as 51PEG-B fellow, which is um, which is a fellowship funded by the Heising Simons uh, Foundation. Um, and uh, so I did my first two years at Caltech as a postdoc and then started recent as a fellow, a postdoctoral fellow, and then started recently um, as a staff member in COO um, as an instrument scientist. And so I've been working on um, instruments uh, to study exoplanets for since my PhD um, and still doing it and I really enjoy it. Um, recently, I've been working on a couple different instruments, um, the Keck Planet Finder and also another, which is, um, that's a radial velocity spectrograph for Keck 1. Um, and I'm currently working on uh, what's called high spec, which is a near infrared spectrograph to also do um, radial velocity measurements of exoplanets, um, but on Keck 2 and in the near infrared. Um, it also has other many other uh, cool science goals um, other than exoplanet science. But, but today I'm gonna talk to you about uh, the project that I mostly worked on um, uh, as a postdoc and I'm continuing to work on um, as an instrument scientist at COO, which is working on this instrument called Hyrax, which I'll, uh, go way more into detail about. Um, but the idea of it is to study hot Jupiters and other exoplanets um, and to really test a different approach to doing this. Um, so, you know, exoplanets are stars or planets orbiting stars outside of our solar system. Hot Jupiters are um, Jupiter-sized planets that are orbiting very close to their star, which makes them very hot. And they just happen to be um, easier targets for us to do right now. Um, which is why I find them interesting because we can actually learn things about them today um, with the, the size telescopes we have. Um, so this is a picture of Hyrax um, getting uh, loaded onto a prime focus at the Hale Telescope at Palomar um, in the last year. Um, and so, but first I um, just wanna talk about the outline of this talk. So. I want to first give some background on exoplanet atmospheres in case anyone here is not as familiar with um, how we how we do those measurements, and then I'll talk a bit more about the motivation by Hyrax about Hyrax um, in this over overview uh, to give you an idea of why we chose some of the design decisions um, that make it unique and different from uh, kind of current instruments trying to do this measurement from the ground, uh, and then I'll show. Uh, pictures of the install that are fun to look at and some videos. Um, so let's start with some background um, on exoplanets uh, and their atmospheres. So what do um, exoplanet atmospheres tell us? Um, and why do we why do we find them so interesting to study? Um, they're very difficult to study because the atmosphere in this in this uh, cartoon here, the atmosphere looks quite big, but for Earth, you might have seen pictures of it. It looks like a one layer of an onion on top of this huge uh, planet. They're, they're very uh, small, actually. Um, but, but there's a lot of interesting things that they tell us, including um, the chemical composition of um, the atmosphere, which kind of clues to uh, perhaps the chemical makeup of the planet itself. Um, it 
Also, if there are biosignatures, we would be able to detect them by looking at the chemical makeup of the atmosphere. Um, Planets, just like solar system planets, have clouds and hazes, or at least we expect them to. Um, and so if you want to try to measure these or see if uh, they are present, you would go through the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere can also tell you about the temperature. If you're looking at you know, this, the spectrum of the atmosphere, um, the line profiles in which molecules you actually have um, can conclude to the temperature of the, the planet's atmosphere. And then you even some uh, studies have been able to get at the um, like winds and other dynamics um, in the atmosphere um, and the circulation. So these are all like really interesting things that uh, you know if you um, are looking at a planet, you know we don't just have to be limited to the mass of it or the the radius. You can um, look at the atmosphere and kind of get at all these interesting properties. And so. Um, so it's interesting to do this for, for one planet, but if you can actually do this for many, many planets, that's where it gets really interesting um, because then you can start comparing the properties between the planets and start looking at things like, you know, does the stellar composition have something, you know, does that inform the, the planet's composition? Um, does, does the planet's uh, cloud content and hazes make sense given the irradiation that the planet's getting based on the, the stellar um, temperature and distance? Um, so there's a lot of interesting things you can you can do once you have a large sample of, of planets. Um, and with this and all these planets, um, you can start answering questions like how unique the solar system is. You can place the like, solar system planets into context. Um, you know, you can start at looking for planets that, you know, maybe they look like they could be habitable because their temperatures uh, are amenable to, to life and maybe you found water in the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, and then also how the host star impacts, impacts the planet um, to try and understand, you know, why a planet might be habitable and another one isn't. Um, all these questions are, you know, ongoing things people are studying. You know, we haven't found any, um, you know, the planets that are the ones that are Earth-like are the ones that are really hard to study. So we haven't quite gotten there yet, but uh, developing our techniques and um, pushing the limits of our instruments are the ways that we're going to get there. So um, as you've probably heard of, um, Kepler mission, was uh, crucial to increasing the number of planets that uh, we know of. Um, and it was followed by the TESS mission, um, which was, went after a um, slightly different sample of stars. But both of these um, space uh, surveys operated via the transit method. So they were looking for stars, um, so planets that were orbiting, uh, transiting their stars um, in their orbit. Uh, as uh, because of the orientation of the planets um, of the planet between Earth and the star, um, it needs to be in line so that it's transiting. So in this uh, video here, um, it just shows this transit method. The planet is oriented such that it crosses in front of its star, and we see this, and we see a dip in the light of the star um, as the planet crosses it. Um, and from the dip that you see in the in this figure here, that can tell you the ratio of the area of the planet to the area of the star, which tells you um, if you know this the stellar properties well enough, it tells you the radius of the planet. And in this way, um, you know most of our the five thousand plus planets that we know of um, were discovered in this in this way. Um, which is useful because the transit method is also a popular way to study the atmospheres of planets. Um, and so we have a very, very large sample of planets that we can use um, what's called transit spectroscopy to study the, the atmospheres. Um, so how does transit spectroscopy work? Um, so again, you're dealing with transiting planets. So um, the plant, the starlight um, crosses, you know, around or 
the the planet transits its stars such that you know the some of the light that is traveling to Earth also uh, some of it gets blocked by the planet, but some of it also passes through the planet's atmosphere. So um, that's what's being shown here. Some light, um, say it goes through the planet atmosphere, um, it doesn't get absorbed or scattered. It'll make it to uh, the observer um, on Earth. But some of the light, um, if it's you know the right wavelength, it'll get absorbed by some molecules in the planet's atmosphere. And some light might get scattered. And so the way that you um, utilize this method, transit transmission spectroscopy, um, to study the exoplanet atmosphere is that you do the same thing that I showed in the previous slide of measuring the transit uh, of the planet, but you do it in different colors. Um, and so that's kind of what this diagram on the bottom left here is showing. Um, it's showing the planet at many points of its orbit and the resulting light curves that you get. And the dip in the light curve, remember, corresponds to the size of the planet. Um, but if your planet's absorbing light um, because its atmosphere is opaque at certain wavelengths, then the planet's going to look bigger at those wavelengths. Um, and then, uh, so that's true in like this blue color here. Um, but if the planet, um, you know, if light just passes straight through the atmosphere because it's um, transparent at that wavelength, then the, the planet will look uh, smaller. And so the way that um, we actually do this measurement, you know, we need instruments to do this. So how does this actually work? Um, we, what you first do is you observe the star as the planet transits, but you do it in different colors. So you, um, so typically what's done is you disperse the light, you know, either you can use a prism or a diffraction grating, um, but basically you take a spectrum of the star as the planet's transiting. Um, and then using that spectrum, you can bin it up into different wavelengths um, and then create light curves um, like I'm showing here uh, in this that figure. Um, and so for each of each wavelength, you get a different light curve that you can then measure the planet's radius in, um, which corresponds to how much absorption is happening to in the atmosphere. So this is an example spectrum of an exoplanet atmosphere. Um, in the visible, and you can see um, this very strong sodium feature um, around uh, 590 uh, nanometers. And there's also maybe some hints of lithium and potassium, um, but they're just plotting the planet radius as a function of wavelength here. Um, and then the way that we analyze it is that we fit um, Fit the data with with models to constrain the abundances of the elements. So, um, in this talk, I'm be talking about high, talking about Hyrax, and I'm gonna kind of be focusing on the instrument side of things um, in terms of how this measurement is done. Um, one thing to to discuss is kind of like our gaps in instrumentation to do this technique. So, so the whole a uh, basis of this technique is to, you know, measure the transit as a uh, in different colors, um, and the way that this is done best is um, from space, where you don't have telluric absorption um, due to Earth's atmosphere. And uh, the Hubble Space Telescope has been crucial in um, performing a lot of these measurements uh, because it doesn't have to worry about. Earth's atmosphere, which has a lot of the same molecules, you know, that we're looking for in um, in these planets. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, obviously, is um, I don't know if you've seen some of the spectra. I have I have one on the next slide. They're incredible, <laughs> um, and uh, it's operating in the near infrared. But actually, it can go all the way down to 600 nanometers, but only at a resolution of about 100. Um, in one of its uh, operating modes, the, the near spec prism mode. Um, so both of these instruments are um, pretty low resolution at R of about 100, um, which is total, which is very useful um, still. But um, there's benefit to going to higher resolution. 
Um, they're also very competitive to get time. We're not going to be able to do every single planet with them. Also, Hubble's lifetime is limited. Um, and so it would be really great if we could do some of these measurements from the ground. Um, and particularly with visible coverage, because um, telluric absorption isn't as big of an issue uh, in the visible. And from the ground, we can really play around with our instrumentation, um, especially there's so many more telescopes from the ground. They have very large apertures. Um, and so if, if we, and you know, a lot of them are readily available. Um, so if we could um, develop an instrument to do this from the ground um, in the visible, it would really complement um, what we can do from space. And just to show you that uh, James Webb spectrum, this is WASP-39B, WASP um, where they um, used several modes um, to characterize the atmosphere. Um, and so these are all the, the same planet, but just different wavelengths and slightly different resolutions depending on the instrument setup. And you can see all this water and carbon monoxide and CO2 and so many molecules. Um, and it's just, uh, I should have, well, you saw one example of spectrum a few slides before, but this is just next level, obviously, in terms of wavelength coverage um, and precision. And I just want to point to a couple um, to a couple molecules here, or to a couple atoms, really, uh, the sodium and potassium features. Um, so Hyrax is is focused on measuring sodium. And yeah, I just wanted to point out that James Webb uh, can cover um, the sodium and potassium, um, which uh, Hyrax is interested in going after. Um, but it again, it's at about R of 100 um, in terms of resolution. Um, and these are interesting features to cover at both low and high resolutions um, and in between. <laughs> Um, so what's cool about sodium and potassium? Well, first of all, and this is somewhat true of all um, spectral features and next planet atmospheres, but sodium and potassium are cool because they're just, uh, they're one concentrated feature that's very, very strong typically. Um, it's not like a very wide um, absorption feature like, um, like for example, this some of the, like the carbon monoxide and water features are very, very broad, whereas like sodium, potassium, there's kind of just like one little line. Um, uh, but you can um, get at the, how cloudy an atmosphere is. Um, and so this is because, so if, for a cloud free atmosphere on the left, um, what's being shown here is the absorption of the atmosphere as a function of wavelength. So just again, like the size of the planet, um, depending on how much the, the atmosphere is absorbing. And for a cloud-free atmosphere, you'll get the full profile of sodium, which is very broad due to pressure broadening um, in the atmosphere. So at very low uh, regions in the atmosphere, um, which is why the right-hand axis says altitude, because this is akin to altitude, the lower you go in the atmosphere, the more the higher the pressure is, because this is particularly um, found in like Jupiter-sized planets. That have fairly deep atmospheres. And so the it's very high pressure at those regions. So you get a very broad absorption feature because you get you're getting like different um, velocities. And um, so there's many different wavelengths um, at which the uh, sodium can absorb light at. Um, and then in the core, um, the higher up you go, it becomes very narrow um, where the pressure is lower. So sodium will tell you about that. Um, and then also, if there's clouds, you you won't be able to see low in the atmosphere after a certain point. Um, you know, the clouds are basically going to look like the planet's surface to you. You're not going to really know the difference. Um, but um, in the case of sodium, because we know because uh, the so the width of the line kind of tells you what the pressure is, you can kind of figure out if it's um, if it's clouds or um, whether it's just the the planet's surface. Uh, another cool thing about sodium and potassium um, are that uh, we think that it could be a potential way to go after exomoons. Um, and the reason is there's, um, well, there's one amazing example in our solar system, which is Io, 
Um, and in this picture here, this image, um, you can see this like torus um, around uh, Io. And this is a plasma cloud um, from, uh, um, from a, so Io is very volcanic and there's a lot of outgassing. Um, and the, the plasma that's being outgassed from Io gets sucked in uh, to this torus and it gets influenced by the magnetic fields of Jupiter. Um, and it creates this huge um, region that you can actually measure um, with a much smaller telescope than what was um, done to do this, um, this image here. But in this plasma cloud, there's, um, there's a lot of different molecules. Like I think sulfur was the main one that was that's in this image here, but there's also a lot of sodium. Um, and so we see a lot of sodium in, in exoplanet atmospheres, um, but it, depending on the velocity and like uh, um, of the sodium feature that you, you measure, um, it's possible that the sodium could be due to an exomoon instead. Um, this is, you know, take a lot of uh, very pre high precision measurements to do this, but people are starting to try. Um, and basically you use like, uh, the perceived distance of the sodium signal um, and the velocity of it to infer that, you know, the, these velocities don't make sense if they're just coming from extended, uh, the, you know, far out in the, the planet's atmosphere. It makes more sense for there to be like a second body causing it. Um, and so this, this makes it interesting as well, especially just to, to know what planets have it, um, have sodium in their atmospheres, then we can go do follow-up observations. Perhaps, typically, you want to do say even higher resolution um, to, to study this. OK, so um, let me just check. I can't see the um, chat, so I'll just assume that um, someone can interrupt if um, the chat has any questions. But otherwise, I'll move on to part two um, and kind of start discussing more about Hyrax itself. All right. So um, given this background on exoplanet atmospheres and, um, and how cool sodium is, um, and I'll just note that we choose to go after sodium over potassium because sodium's uh, typically um, more prevalent in astrophysical bodies um, of varying kinds, not just planets. Um, so it typically a, produces a stronger feature. Um, but the goal of Hyrax is to um, develop a filter-based instrument design to do R of about 1500 to 2000 um, transit transmission spectroscopy measurements um, at Palomar Observing, so Observatory using the Hale Telescope. Um, and then using this instrument, we, we hope to classify the pre sodium presence in a population of exoplanets. Um, and the project was funded um, in 2021 um, by the Keck Institute for Space Sciences and Heising Simons in 2022. Um, it's just a small team of uh, Caltech and JPL scientists and engineer working on it. Um, and there's been a lot of work being done. We haven't quite got to the observing um, phase, uh, but first light, uh, we've done first light and um, hoping to keep working um, on getting it back on sky um, later this year. I see. Okay. For some reason I can't see my cursor, so I'm just gonna, oh, okay. All right, so the um, so the goal of Hyrax is to go after this sodium feature. So um, I'll go over the optical design in a bit, but light from the telescope goes to, to Hyrax, and then at the detector, the goal is to have at least a few images of a star um, with um, bandwidth of about R fifteen hundred, which is about like 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 nanometers wide. Um, and so the picture on the top right kind of shows like the goal of what we want our optics to do. So it's like three images of the same exact star, but on one detector in three different wavelengths. 
And the idea is that these wavelengths, um, you can see in the bottom right figure, um, these wavelengths are chosen to kind of tile the sodium feature. So now I was showing sodium kind of look like emission, but now it's being plotted as one minus the ratio of the area of the planet to the star. So it's like a dip, but the idea is the same that that's the exoplanet, um, the change in the exoplanet size as a function of wavelength. And our band passes are tiling that, that spectral feature to try and characterize it. Um, the higher to do these measurements, you really need a lot of photons because um, the signals are quite small. Um, so we want the instrument to be very high throughput. So a lot of um, work went into making it high throughput. Um, and we also, it's also very important that there's no like systematic errors in, in uh, due to anything in the, the instrument. So you don't want to clip like one of the images of the star in one band. Um, you don't want to clip one and the or not the other, but you also don't want to clip all of them <laughs> um, because then if you know the the light is changing um, from frame to frame as you're trying to measure the the transit very precisely, that's a problem. You also don't want you know detector effects, um, things like that. Um, so that's very important. Um, and so just to comment on the resolution and why we chose our like fifteen hundred to two thousand. Um, at low resolution, you start to really blend the line, um, and it's okay if you have a really broad um, wavelength coverage, but um, there's interesting, it's interesting to resolve the core of the line, and if the sodium feature is not very strong, you really want to increase um, your resolution. And so at low resolution, uh, Oh, there we go. At low resolution, um, if the sodium feature is not very strong, you're gonna your bandwidth are very wide because um, you're at low resolution, and you'll start really averaging the spectrum down to the point where you can't really see the feature. So these um, red pluses are kind of indicating like if the the measurement in the model is the the black line in this case. Um, but if you increase the resolution to higher resolutions, then you're not averaging down, you know, high regions with low regions. You're keeping them kind of separate, and then your your signal gets stronger. Um, and for sodium and potassium, these like these alkali lines, um, are about two thousand is is ideal for this, especially if you're really zooming in around the core of the line. And so that's why we went for our about fifteen hundred. Um, so then this kind of asks the question of, well, what instrument do you use to do this? And like, what's your design concept? Um, if, as you many, as you all know, and I'm sure everyone's done, um, you've put a filter in front of your um, camera to filter out light. So you're only looking at um, one wavelength band. You might even have sodium filters at home. Um, and so why don't we just um, use a filter? Why, why isn't this more common? Um, so the, the, you know, it's nice because you have a simple wavelength solution, you know what the wavelength your filter is letting through. Um, you also don't have to worry about the, the image quality, which I can just explain more um, in a bit. But the, the reason is because typical filters are a bit too wide. Remember, we want like 0.4 nanometers wide. Um, and so traditionally, you know, using narrowband filters is just, narrowband filters, filters haven't been too common in astronomy. And so, um, and you also are kind of limited to one band at a time, which is very inefficient. Um, on the other hand, um, if you use like a prism to disperse your light um, into a spectrum, um, you can't use a slit because then as the star moves on your slit, you're getting more or less light as the planet's transiting and that causes a lot of error in your measurement. Um, but the, the benefit though, is that you get a wide wavelength coverage all at one go. You also can use prisms to get really high resolution. Um, our 1000, it's pretty easy to do with the prism. Um, but if your stellar image, like if you have bad seeing on one night, your star is gonna look, is gonna kind of blow up a bit and your resolution is gonna change because you can't use a slit. Um, and so you're sensitive to image quality in this case. You also don't know like what wavelength is what um, on your detector unless you have a way to uh, calibrate that. Um, and we need 
the wavelength solution to be fairly accurate for this, um, this measurement. So it's like, what do you do? Um, so that's the idea for Hyrax. Um, so narrowband filters um, exist um, at the 0 0.3, 0 0.4 nanometer width. Um, so we designed uh, this instrument around that in such a way that we can get multiple images of the star through multiple filters at the same time on one detector. Um, and the idea doing that is um, spe these Fabry Pro based narrowband filters, they um, reflect all the light that isn't let through. Um, and so you can actually recycle that light and pass it through another filter. So that's that's what's shown here in this bottom left image. Um, and that's the basis of the Hyrax design. And in this way, you know the wavelength solution of your um, each of your stars, because you know the wavelength profile of your filter. Um, if your image quality changes, it doesn't matter. You're just spreading the star's image across more pixels. It's not ideal, but it doesn't change your resolution. Um, and you can do you can cascade these filters um, such that you can do multiple wavelengths at one, in one go um, and have more wavelength coverage. And they make them as low um, as R of about point or width of about 0.2 nanometers, so you can get R of 2,000. I mean, a little bit more. And these filters have actually started to be uh, started to be used. Um, in the wild, <laughs> in the world of astronomy. So for example, um, also at Palomar, uh, work the wide field infrared camera, um, a student at Caltech installed a narrowband filter centered on the metastable, metastable helium line um, uh, in the near infrared. And um, with that filter, they were actually able to detect helium um, in several exoplanet atmospheres, which had been done before um, using high resolution spectrographs, but um, this is the first time using a filter. And you can see in this plot on the right is the, again, just uh, transits measured at two different wavelengths. Uh, the red one is in the helium uh, line and you can see the planet looks much bigger there because its atmosphere is absorbing. Um, in that wavelength. Um, and this is interesting because helium actually informs us of atmospheric escape. It's a very interesting line to look at. Um, for Hyrex, um, uh, we decided to, instead of incorporating it into an existing instrument at Palomar, we decided to um, build it, make it its own instrument. Uh, also for prime focus, um, because to reduce the number of reflections, um, uh, I'll go into a detail about uh, a complication that brings in a couple slides, but just to walk through the optical design. Um, so light from the telescope um, is shown here on the left. Um, there's three narrowband filters. We can add more, but um, for now we just have three. Um, so light from the telescope goes through the first filter. Um, it gets, it gets collimated, it goes through the first filter um, and then bounces off this mirror to the detector. And then the light that doesn't pass through um, gets recycled and reflected back through a second filter. And then this happens one more time so that we get our three images of our star through our three um, wavelengths. The light that doesn't um, get used, it gets sent to um, a spectrograph for a little pocket spectrometer for monitoring Earth's atmosphere, um, which luckily isn't too severe around the sodium feature, but um, is important to do to ensure that you're um, not being impacted by variable telluric absorption. And at the very beginning of the instrument, you can see there that um, blue light gets sent to a guide camera for guiding to ensure um, that the star is always centered on our filters. And so one thing to know about these filters is that they have a, a dependence on the angle of incidence of light passing through them. So this little cartoon here tries to um, show that. So white light from the star on the left is passing through this filter here um, that's only letting through red light. Um, so as the filter changes angles here, the color of the star becomes bluer and bluer. Um, 
and this depends on the index of refraction of the material um, and the starting wavelength. Um, there's a little formula there. Uh, but this, this is actually kind of useful because it means you can order one filter um, multiple times, which is cheaper than buying multiple filters with different specifications. Um, not necessary to do that, but we just we did that um, here. It does, um, other than that one benefit, it does uh, bring interesting, uh, some interesting design challenges. Um, the first one being is that you really start to care about any changes of angles going through your filter. So this diagram is kind of showing the, the problems of beam compression. Um, so uh, with a five meter telescope, you have to take all of that light and compress it down into your instrument, which for Hyrax, the optics are only like 1.75 inches wide. And so any angle at the front gets um, gets enlarged by that ra the ratio of like how big your optics are in your instrument to how big your your telescope is, um, and so uh, so our field is about six arc seconds, which isn't very wide. But what it means is that um, a three arc second field of view it turns into a 0.2 degree um, angle at our filters. So this is about, if you do the math, it's about 0.01 nanometers, which means that um, around our star at the edge of our field, the light actually becomes a little bit bluer. It turns out 0.01 nanometers isn't, um, isn't too large, and this would mostly impact back, background subtraction. Um, so we're not too worried about it, but it was an interesting thing to, to worry about before we did the math. <laughs> Um, another challenge um, with these filters is uh, polarization splitting. So as you increase the angle of incidence of light um, on the filters, uh, you start to, one polarization sees a different shift um, compared to a different uh, polarization. So you can see on the very far right in this figure, which is showing the um, throughput of the filter as a function of wavelength. Um, the black line there on the right is at zero angle of instance, so the pol both polarizations match up. You start to increase the, the angle go of the light passing through the filter, um, and at 20 degrees, they start to kind of um, not align perfectly, and then all the way at 30 degrees, you're starting to see one of the polarizations um, really reduces um, or it causes, they, they see very different effects, and then combined, you get this kind of broader um, profile of your filter. So this kind of limits how what angles you can operate at to reduce this effect. Um, we were able to avoid it, but um, if you want to add more and more filters, there kind of becomes a, a limit that you reach. So actually, those were... we have a, actually, we have a question in the, in the uh, chat box. Okay, let me open it. Uh, okay, the question, I'll go ahead and read it. Is Hyrax modular so that it can be fitted to any telescope? Um, is there are there telescope limitations this can be used with certain sizes? So that um, <laughs> that yeah, that's a perfect question um, for these last two slides because um, the last slide let me see here, kind of shows that um, yeah the for spectrographs the larger your um, telescope is the the larger your instrument's going to be that's kind of like a design truth. Um, because of this beam compression aspect, um, and especially if you want to maintain the same resolution. So when I was first designing this instrument, I was like, oh, this is great. Like, we don't have that issue because it's just an imager. But um, because of this angle issue, because um, you don't want the angles on your filter to be too um, large, uh, it's you would have to slightly change the design um, as you go between telescopes. It gets easier the smaller the telescope is, because um, uh, your your beam compression will be less. Um, but and you can see it's the related to the the focal length actually. So um, being at prime focus um, is where the beams converging um, quickly um, has has a impact on this. Um, 
So in that sense, you, you would have to do some changes to the distances, the optics sizes, and you would have to check things like this, the angles on your filter and stuff like that. But otherwise, um, so, so yeah, you wouldn't be able to just move Hyrex to another telescope, um, but it wouldn't be too bad to redesign it for um, a different telescope. Okay, if there aren't any other questions. Um, so that kind of covers the, the motivation um, and uh, some overview on the instrument. Um, so now I just wanna talk about kind of like where we're at and also future work. Let me just check the, the chat again. Oh, cool, I'm glad it answered your, your question. And sorry, sometimes I lose my cursor. All right. Um, okay, so building Hyrex, um, a lot of the work um, during my postdoc uh, was to kind of sort through all those issues I just talked about um, and then get the, the optics design optimized, um, which this cartoon kind of shows the final optic Goal layout. Um, and then I worked with an engineer, um, Lauren Fahey at um, COO, who helped me with the mechanical design, um, which is shown in the middle here. Um, and then on the right, um, uh, you can see that we bought all of the components and started assembling them and aligning them um, in the Exoplanet Technology Lab at Caltech. And um, from there, um, with, with this just rough alignment, we actually went to Palomar, um, went to the telescope for a fit check. Um, so it, we were going off of uh, CAD models on of the prime focus pedestal at um, which you'll see in a, in a upcoming image here. And, you know, before you spend so much time aligning and after you, you know, you spot everything, you really want to know that oh, it's focused where you think it is. Um, so we went to, to Palomar and we rode up the elevator to prime focus um, and put Hyrax on and confirmed that we were uh, able to focus the instrument. Um, so it's always a treat to go to, um, to Palomar, it's such a cool place. Um, and it's really nice to, to build an instrument that, that goes there because um, it's yeah only a two hour drive and um, everyone there is like super nice. Um, so this is a video of Hyrax being lifted up. I think they have new crane uh, and spreader bar requirements at Palomar now. Um, so we'll have to change this. It's a little uh, wobbly. So that's something that we're kind of still sorting out. Um, it does have a high center of gravity. Uh, the way that we got it to Palomar was that we uh, loaded up a U-Haul and drove it down, <laughs> which was um, kind of a feat. I definitely, next time I go to Palomar, it's going to be the last time and it's going to stay there because it's <laughs> quite an ordeal to to get the instrument um, transported down there. Although it is, you know, or as far as instruments go, it's on the small spot, on the small, uh, small side. So maybe I shouldn't complain. Um, so that's Lauren and Nem uh, Jemanovich um, at, also at Caltech who helped a lot with the mechanical design and, and loading it. Um, and actually we've got another question here from Dave Decker. All right. What is the reference for the wavelength calibration when each of the filters generates a different light path to the same sensor? Also a uh, great question. Um, so the we don't have a reference calibration source, but we do have that telluric um, spectro spectrometer, pocket spectrometer. So all of the light, it's actually kind of interesting. Uh, let me... So like, let me go back to that slide. Um, so all of the light that doesn't go through the filters gets sent to this pocket spectrometer. And I purposely designed the wavelength range to overlap um, the filter profile, uh, absorption profiles, um, such that in the spectrum uh, of the light that doesn't go through um, the filters that gets rejected, you can actually see the notches from the filters. And by looking at that, you can um, see 
what the what wavelengths are going through your filters. And we don't expect any changes to happen after um, that happens. So that's how we do that. Um, although I will be thinking of ways to calibrate it um, other than that. And I think we'll be doing tests in lab to really characterize the stability of the band passes because they are temperature sensitive, very slightly so, but enough that we worry about it. All right. So continuing with the just fun videos, mostly at this point of Hyrax. Um, so this is just the next uh, phase of uh, bringing Hyrax up to prime focus. Um, but it's the view from the top now. Uh, yeah, it is. it was definitely terrifying the first time this happened, but apparently standard procedure, so. <laughs> They're very uh, talented crane operators. Um, so this is the pedestal um, that the uh, that Hyrex sits on. It has um, an adapter plate at the bottom here that uh, connects to it so that it's secure. Um, and then light from the telescope comes up and it focuses um, right here. Um, we actually have a a um, field mask here at focus um, so that we can have a wider uh, wider than six arc seconds view of the sky when we're centering on the star. And then we can, we don't want to send field light from, you know, more than six arc seconds through the instrument because um, we don't want any uh, stray light reaching the detector. Um, so then we slide the mask back in and only let through six arc seconds in when we're doing science. Um, so here's it, um, lowering, <clears throat> um, so that's kind of, um, where we left off. We went on a second trip, um, where more of the optics were, uh, installed, um, Actually, the first trip we didn't have all the optics in. In the second trip, there was one optic that we were missing, so we couldn't actually um, do science on sky. But um, we were able to do a lot of tests um, and commissioning of the instrument, um, including getting all the electronics um, sorted out, um, testing the OM4 fiber runs, um, which we use to communicate to some of our electronics. Um, and uh, also um, on the right here, you can see uh, a screenshot of my com uh, computer as I was testing the, the guiding software. Um, guiding is important because we don't want any little offsets of the star, because if you have an offset um, through your filters, you, they'll turn into an angle change at your filter, um, which will uh, change the wavelength of your light, as we saw earlier. And so um, I have a bunch of data, um, guiding data um, to use to kind of make sure that that's not gonna be an issue and that our guiding um, software operates well enough. So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we're hoping to actually do a survey of exoplanets um, and to look for sodium uh, in their atmospheres. And, uh, so currently Hyrex is, um, back at Caltech. Um, so I think I mentioned this before the talk started, but uh, I've been working on a couple other projects. Um, I'm the main one working on Hyrex. So I had to take a little break, um, to work on some high resolution spectrometers, which are cool. And I hope to use to actually, uh, actually in conjunction with Hyrex to do sodium measurements, um, at very, very high resolution where different things start to, um, was, was, yeah, it's kind of a different uh, topic, which I do have slides on if anyone has questions about. Um, but uh, I think it, in a month or so, I'll be able to start um, realigning Hyrax. And then once it's, um, I have done some, some more lab tests, including that one of kind of measuring how stable the, the width um, or the wavelengths of the filter bands are um, as a function of temperature and stuff, tests like that then uh, it'll return to Palomar and um, 
apply for some some time to to actually go after some exoplanet transits. Um, and just to show you um, one final um, complex plot here. Um, so given the current estimates of the throughput of Hyrax, which are actually about 50 to 60%, but in this plot, I'm just, I have, I think these curves are assuming like a 40% throughput being conservative. Um, this is showing like a bunch of exoplanet targets that we could possibly do that are um, visible from the Northern hemisphere. So this is the V-band magnitude of each of the host stars as a function of how deep we expect the transit signal to be um, in the sodium feature. Um, and then these curves, um, the blue and yellow and magenta curves are showing like our detection limits. So everything above to the right of these curves we can um, detect. Um, so uh, with the Hale telescope, these are the yellow lines um, at which at their current um, throughput level of like 40% um, that we, we know we can achieve. In one and two transits, there's about 12 targets that we can go, uh, that we could get. Um, so we'll apply for some time to go after these depending on which ones are transiting um, in the semester. Um, and if we actually, if we increase the throughput to about 80%, which is um, possible if we uh, get a really nice detector, <laughs> currently the, our detector was, um, it's great, but you know, it's, um, the budget for this project was about 85,000, which is like the cost of a nice detector. <laughs> so there's some, there's some budgeting there. Um, then in three transits, we could do even more planets, um, which is the magenta curve. So, so it's pretty um, exciting. I'm excited to um, actually do these measurements and kind of see where we're at. Um, and that's kind of uh, where I left the talk. Um, Ashley, you've got a couple of questions there in the in the uh, chat window. Great, thanks for letting me know. So my cursor is just coming and going. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, okay, sorry, let me just. All right, if I let's. Okay, first question is: If you change the angle of incidence of a filter to obtain a different wavelength, how do you mechanically mount and calibrate the filters? So um, let's see if I understand this correctly. So, um, so if we change the angle of incidence of the on the of the filter itself, um, so there are no moving parts in this in the in Hyrax. So, the angle of incidence of the filters with respect to the um, incoming light should be the same. Um, and uh, if we when we mount them um, the first time. Uh, we can use the pocket spectrometer to actually make sure that the um, the angle is correct um, to within our tolerance. Uh, the pocket spectrometer is the tolerance that we get from that is um, sufficient for for doing that alignment. Um, and so it's the mechanical mounts of the filters are just. Uh, screwed on. So there's um, some adjustment in the tip. Let's see. I think these mounts are not the ones with the filters in it, but they are the same type. You can see there's like these little knobs here that allow for fine adjustment of the angle. Um, so we can use those, um, but otherwise the goal on sky is to like have the angles always be constant and have the star always aligned in the center of the field such that um, so that we don't have to worry about any any changes in the in the angle, but that's definitely something that we'll keep an eye on. Um, and then the follow up question to that one was, um, what type is the pocket spectrometer? Um, that's a good question. Let's see, can I remember the? There's this company that um, I used in my PhD, but that they changed their name. Um, I think it was used to be called Ocean Optics, but now they go by a different name. But they, um, it's like, I don't remember the specifications exactly, but it covers like 100 nanometers at like R of like 500 to 1000 or something, actually fairly similar to um, Hyrax, but it's a spectrometer. So 
it doesn't do stable or precision photometry. Um, so its goal is to just measure the relative um, flux so we can get the depth of the toric lines and the positions of the, the filters. Um, another question is, can you please explain how you thought of the design? Um, so in grad school, I worked with Professor Colin Blake at UPenn and it started as, um, the whole concept of Hyrex started as um, an idea to go after oxygen um, in Earth-like planets, like in future missions, uh, like space missions even. The idea is that oxygen feature at 760 nanometers is like, has a really strong um, band head and where there's tons of absorption. But if you have like low resolution, you're like averaging that out and you're not maximizing the signal, which we saw before for the sodium feature. Um, but uh, you can't know, we're not really doing high resolution from space right now. Um, and so, and the idea was to like produce like the most efficient, like throwing away no fo as few photons as we can um, instrument at the right resolution for it. So that's kind of where the imaging based design came from. And from there it kind of developed. And then I was like, you know, sodium's the perfect, you know, feature to do this with targets that we we have ex that are accessible to us now in terms of what we can actually characterize um, given the, the size telescopes that we need for these measurements um, to get enough photons. So that's kind of how the, the concept evolved. Um, yeah. And then, and then you start digging into things like, you know, how stable do things need to be? And, oh, we have to worry about tolerics. And then you start adding things to um, make sure you cover your bases to actually be able to do the measurement. Um, okay, there's a couple more questions. Um, if you had five times the budget, say, how would you change the instrument besides a better detector? Um, another thing that's limiting the throughput of Hyrex is that we're using um, off-the-shelf optics. Um, so we are stuck with the AR coatings that, um, that come on those optics. So uh, getting custom coatings is something I would use to spend, um, to, I would spend some mon more money on. Um, I would have more filters, um, and I would design the filters so, and have a bigger instrument so that, <laughs> and maybe space the optics out better. Uh, probably a lot of this, this budget will go towards labor, <laughs> um, to get more filters and yeah, higher code, uh, better coatings and um, yeah, that's, and, and the larger the optics can be, then you have, you worry less about um, the beam compression factor. So also go to custom optics, which cost off the shelf optics, which we're doing right now, like they kind of come up to like two inches in um, diameter. So that's kind of what was, setting our optic size. We went as big as we could. Um, okay, another question. The data includes flux from the star, some of which passes through the planet atmosphere. Do you need to subtract the star flux from the filtered data to identify the sodium lines of the atmosphere? Yes. Um, you look, you measure the, the relative change in the stellar flux over time. Um, and you use that to measure the size of the planet. So you don't actually have to subtract out the stellar. Um, so this, if assuming the star is not changing, which is another question, question um, to be addressed, then you can just look at the relative changes in the star flux. So you don't actually have to subtract the star because um, you're just looking at relative changes. If the star is changing, um, which is something that you do have to worry about, um, sodium can be, it's, yeah, it can change. Um, you would hope it wouldn't change during your measurement because it's over one period of time. Between measurements, maybe the sodium um, in the star could change. Um, so that's something that you would, you would want to be careful about. Um, should I keep going? 
I'm enjoying, these are great questions. Uh, sure, go ahead. All right, um, would you like another, oh, I worked in laser optics. Would you like another company to contact? They have done custom optics. Oh, cool. Um, I definitely like to be up, uh, knowledgeable of um, all the vendors to use for, um, for optics companies. I think for Hyrax, we probably won't pursue custom optics right now because um, we don't have the budget. Um, but certainly for um, other instruments I work on, it's good to know um, what companies are out there. So um, yeah, if you, if you have companies that you would recommend, I would be happy to hear. Um, and then can you see this instrument being used for other purposes? That's a great question. Uh, I um, I think that, um, so the applications of this instrument are um, scenarios where you need very precise um, photomet uh, photometry, you need very precise photometry, and you're in a regime potentially where you need high throughput. Um, and I've thought about this, I feel like I've come up with another application for this. Um, I mean, obviously there's other spectral features to do, um, but if exoplanet, like you, it would be like transients um, essentially, because you're looking at the relative photometry over time. Um, so potentially any other transients where there's a spectral feature that's changing and you want to um, capture that. For example, brown dwarfs, um, they rotate and they have it's been shown that their cloud content, um, if it's you know if it's banded or something as it rotates, you see changes in the flux um, in certain spectral features as a function of time. Um, so you could look for, you could try to measure that. One problem is you might not be able to go too narrow band, um, but you you also might have to go to the near infrared um, because they're very red objects. Um, so you might have to do some adjustments, but the concept might might work. At what age did you find astronomy your choice of science? Huh. That's a good, I, I like switching it up. Um, were your parents amazed at what you were studying in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college? You know, it's hard to impress parents sometimes. <laughs> no. um, I wanted to do astronomy uh, when I was in high school. Um, I watched Nova a lot as a kid and I definitely preferred the astronomy specials um, and kind of forgot about astronomy until I could take a class. My high school, I went to a boarding school for science, people who like science. <laughs> so we got to, I got to take an astronomy class there. Um, and then just, I knew I wanted to pursue physics and then I got into astronomy research in college. Um, so that was kind of my path. I was, it was kind of, I knew early on, which was, it's helpful, I guess, because um, physics and astronomy are usually pretty loaded majors. You have to take a lot of classes. So if you start late, you would have to take an extra semester, which sometimes people don't choose to do. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my path. Um, what is the exposure time to get results with Hyrax and how many images do you get for a transit? Um, I do not remember what exposure times I need. So the stars themselves are pretty bright. Um, so even though you're, um, you're still photon noise limited because you're going after really small measurements, um, you're typically looking at pretty bright stars. Um, so I think like 10 or, you know, 30 seconds ish um, to three minutes could be exposure times. The transits themselves last like four to five, well, two hours-ish, and then you wanna get like an hour before and after. So um, the there's definitely like a duty cycle there in terms of waiting for the detector to read out and then starting another exposure, but there'll definitely be like hundreds of images, um, you know, at least a hundred images to work with. Um, what information can you get by comparing the flux levels in the three bands? Yeah, so let me go back to that. Um, 
Let's go to this image. So with three bands, um, our main goal is to measure the like presence of sodium. So um, the data, these X's or crosses here kind of show the simulated measurements that we expect to get um, for one transit of, um, I think one of the brighter um, targets that we would go after. And um, after doing like, you know, four hours transit observation um, and fitting the whole transit, et cetera. Um, this is, these are the air bars you would see. So um, with this amount of sodium, which we kind of expect for this planet, um, you would definitely be able to detect the, um, the feature and then you can fit it and fitting it will constrain kind of like the abundance of sodium um, and like perhaps the width of the sodium feature. But to really um, understand the planet's atmosphere as a, on a whole, you would definitely want more uh, wavelength coverage. Um, and so you can combine it with other um, observations to kind of understand like, okay, how, what does the continuum look like out here? Um, for example, uh, does it, you know, cause you don't really know what's happening after these, these points here. Um, and so the idea would be to do like follow-up observations. Um, so yeah, so James Webb won't be able to go after every planet. And I think, um, and low resolution observations um, kind of tell you the absolute abundance that you have in the planet. Whereas if you go to really, really high resolutions, you lose the continuum information because um, it, for like a high resolution, like fiber fed spectrometer, you can't trust the continuum slope um, because you have things like the fiber coupling that are modifying that. So typically you normalize the continuum um, and you just uh, look for, uh, look at the core of the lines and you can, it's interesting because you can then measure the ratio of, this is actually a doublet feature. You can measure the ratio of, um, one of the doublets to the other, which tells you about um, um, the medium that's doing the absorbing, the, yeah, the absorbing. Um, so, uh, so I think in the future, I think this is definitely like a novel instrument. So I think the main goal will be to do these measurements, see if they match our expectations. And um, we would definitely want to add like two more band passes or yeah, um, two more band passes like further out, which should be doable um, with modifications to the design. Um, and then we would be able to tell, uh, really constrain this feature much more. Um, have you heard of other researchers using similar technique? Has anyone asked for your design? Um, so there's another instrument. So there's the helium measurements that I mentioned. Um, and they don't have reference bands. So with the reference bands, um, you can really nail down the, um, the detection better. Because um, uh, if you're relying on measurements from a different instrument at a different time, there's the star could have changed and things like that that would make you lose some confidence in, in that comparison. Um, there's another instrument called Henrietta, Harry, I think, um, which I forget the details of that, um, but it's using kind of a similar concept going, uh, doing, well, it's using a, a dispersed design. It's not using filter-based design, but one thing that they're doing that I'm also interested in doing is using diffusers to, um, uh, diffusers are optics that uh, blur the image of your the light so that it it looks a lot more uniform. Um, you don't get like this one peak and then a halo, um, which I mean you wouldn't really. Well, I guess if you average just seeing disc for a long time, then you would <laughs> get something similar to that. But it it helps with the effects of seeing, which is like you know blurring your image as a function of time. Um, and keeps the amount of flux on each pixel constant to reduce systematics. So they're doing that. So we're kind of chatting. Um, and 
I think it's cool. They're designing their instruments specifically to do exoplanet um, transmission spectroscopy. And so we're kind of interested in each other's ideas and chatting, but, but otherwise I haven't really um, come across. Oh, there was one more met, one more instrument that did this um, with a one filter at a time and they, they could tune their filters bandpass. Um, and they actually got measurements of potassium and sodium that were pretty, um, pretty like imp impressive in terms of, um, yeah, how deep the features were. Um, but they haven't, it was really hard to calibrate the instrument. So they stopped and they didn't have reference bands also. So they haven't really been doing many measurements lately. Um, are you confident that the mechanical stability of the optical mounts on the breadboard is sufficient to maintain the required alignment over time, temperature, and transport conditions? Um, I would say yes. Um, we did think about that a bit. Um, we obviously with the as the telescopes moving, um, you know, you're getting different gra gravity vectors, and um, we have the the there's several brackets on the back of the breadboard uh, it's mounted vertically um that's keeping it very stiff and we added more things to stiffen it um and so that's something that we'll definitely monitor um once we're on sky um since we have the ability to check the the wavelength of each of our filter bands um as we'll look for any correlations with um the telescope position Um, any thoughts how a group like SCAA could encourage more women to study science? Oh, that's a really nice question. Um, yeah, so I think the thing that helped me the most when I was going through school and being the only woman in a class full of men, <laughs> um, which, you know, when you get older is not as much of a problem when you're younger and you don't have as much confidence. Um, it can be hard sometimes. Um, just having like women represented and like um, seeing, like having really strong women role models, I think is what helped me a lot. And just seeing people in positions that I was considering going into. Um, so, so having women talk <laughs> um, at like, yeah, invite, making sure to invite women um, to sit on panels or um, trying to encourage women to come out. Um, and volunteer like um, to be a role models um, to, to younger women, I think is uh, a really good thing um, to encourage more women to study science, um, to just show them that, you know, there's plenty of us out there um, that they can do it too. Um, all right, another question I caught, I can't remember if you mentioned what HIRAX stands for, are you aware there's another HIRAX? Ah, I meant to, <laughs> I think I might've written it on a slide. Maybe I didn't. Hyrax stands for the um, um, High Efficiency Instrument for the Rapid Assessment of Exoatmospheres. And so I made an instrument called CAMEL in grad school that did um, trans, uh, monitoring of atmospheric water vapor. And so because of that, I wanted the do another desert animal. And so I was determined to make Hyrax work, but now I'm like, oh, I don't really like the acronym. <laughs> so sometimes I don't spell it out all the time, um, but that's what it stands for. Um, and I misspelled it on, intentionally. Um, so it was Googleable. And I did see at one point that there was another Hyrax, um, not to mention the animal. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll change it at some point. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that with spectra study, spectral studies, measuring biosignatures is possible. Is that possible now? And if detected, how likely is it that they are indicative of the presence of some sort of life on the planet? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so measuring um, rocky exoplanet atmospheres is currently, I would say, not possible. I think people are going to try it with James Webb. Um, 
So maybe it will be possible. Maybe they'll show that it's possible. Um, it you need like currently James Webb is going to do like tens of parts per million measurements. I think at best, um, and I think that you need slightly less than that to do um, rocky exoplanet atmospheres. But they could do like super Earth atmospheres, um, things that are a little bit bigger. And, you know, maybe those are um, habitable or have biosignatures. So I think if we do measure things like water vapor um, and methane and CO2 um, and measure the temperature of, any, yeah, measure the temperature, you know, try to quantify the temperature of the planet, um, those things might all point to habitability. But in terms of an actual biosignature, um, we probably would want oxygen. Um, oxygen is a really big one. And um, although oxygen does have um, abiotic sources, so which is why you also want to make to measure other molecules such that the planet makes sense, um, like it supports that the oxygen was arrived from a biological source. Um, um, but we're not quite there yet. Um, James Webb isn't going to do a great job of measuring oxygen because it's so low resolution. It's going to really blur across the oxygen feature. It's not going to, and the oxygen, the signal is not going to be strong enough um, such that at that resolution, you can really ca characterize it. Um, we might need larger apertures in space to do that. Um, and so, and we already know how hard it was to get an aperture as big as the James Webb Space Telescope in space. So um, it was a huge undertaking, but definitely not out of the question there, future space missions that like Louvoir that are um, planned to, to be designed to do this. Um, so, so yeah. All right. The questions have subsided. <laughs> the questions have subsided. Are there any more questions? You know, this is just an outstanding talk. And, you know, you can tell a lot of us are engineers and we just love the, all the details of how you get things done and what does the breadboard look like and how do you mount things? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really, the, the questions have been really amazing. So thank you for uh, I, I, paying attention. I, 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 and yeah, I have a really quick one, a real a simple one. I'm just curious, right? This is fascinating, by the way, but uh, uh, we, where you source the exoplanet data when you're trying to identify which is a good candidate to, to do a survey on. I know that NASA has an exoplanet watch program. I mean, do you, is there any like partnership there? Where, where do you get that data from? That'd be interesting. Yeah, um, there's something called the Exoplanet Archive, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, uh, but if not, it's where um, you can get plots like this. Um, so it's out of IPAC actually from Caltech. Um, they manage it and they have like databases of planet properties. Um, and so you can, the plot that I showed that showed like the expected transit signal, um, you make some assumptions about um, that the atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and like this is the temp the temperature um, re as related to what we, you know, the stellar temperature and things like that. Um, so there's, yeah, just tons of data um, for all of these 5,000 plus planets that you can just download um, and play with um, and make cool plots and stuff like that. So Exoplanet Archive. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I just have to ask out of pure curiosity, where is your lab on the Caltech campus? Yeah, so... Um, Let's see the picture that I showed of me. Um, that's in the basement of Cahill. So on California Boulevard, the red building. Um, yeah, I know, I know yeah. Cahill. Yeah. yeah. So it's in the basement of Cahill. The basement. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Where all the labs are hidden away. So if they ever have another meeting up at Caltech, we may come knock on your door. Yeah. Yeah. It's currently there. So <laughs> we can go to Hyrax and I can open the, the door of the the breadboard and show you. Cool. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Are we we've kept you a long time with a lot of good <laughs> questions, but you've been very gracious about answering them. Oh, oh it's okay. been great. Yeah. Okay. Are there any, any final questions from the from the group?
I guess not. You know, we, we'll need reload time and we'll come up with more questions. But thank you so much for, for giving this talk and being with us tonight. This is this has been a great uh, yeah. Uh, evening. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. And I hope to see y'all at um, some in-person astronomy events uh, around SoCal in the future. So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can always come down here. So we, we can we can generate something. I, I've always wanted to do, you know, I talked about the Boy Scout Merit Badge because they have a formal system of those merit badges. And the Girl Scouts don't have anything quite like that. They experiment with stuff, but they don't really have something that's quite that organized. Oh, yeah, it's a shame they should. I, yeah, but I would have loved that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, listen, uh, thank you again, and I'll conclude the meeting. Thanks for, for, for being with us tonight, and uh, uh, best wishes for all of your, uh, your, your successes in this instrument development in your career. Thank you. Thank you. Have, have, have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.